how Major Chuck Wu and Zia Wu plotted the 1966 coup and died in ambush near Nsukka in 1967 inches. Major Chuck Wooman Ziagwu was a young army officer who plotted the military coup of January 15, 1966 which led to the death of many senior Nigerians. The Prime Minister, a federal minister, two regional premiers and top army officers from were brutally murdered in the coup. He was killed during the Nigerian Civil War flown to Kaduna and was giving full military burial following the orders of the then military president, Yakubu Gawan. The story of the Nigerian civil war cannot be completely told without the mention of the name, Major General Kaduna Chuck Womanzi Ogwu. Reasons being that he is said to be the leading brain behind the first military coup in January 1966 which was tagged in Igbu coup leading to a counter coup in June of the same year, the aftermath of which led to the secession of the Biafran territory and subsequent war. Patrick Chuk Wumukudan and Ziongwu hailed from the then Midwestern region town of Akpanam, near Asaba in the present day Anyama area of Delta State. He was born in 1937 in Kaduna, Kaduna State. He attended St. Joseph's Catholic Primary School in Kaduna for his elementary education and for his secondary education he attended the competitive St. John's College in Kaduna. In March 1957 after his secondary education, Nziogwu enlisted as an officer cadet in the Nigeria Regiment of the West African Frontier Force and proceeded on a six-month preliminary training in Ghana, then Gold Coast. He completed his training in Ghana by October 1957 and headed on to the Royal Military Academy, Sandhurst where he was commissioned as an infantry officer in 1959. He later underwent the platoon officer's course in Hythe and a platoon commander's course in Warminster. How Major Chuck Woom and Ziagwu plotted the 1966 coup and died in ambush near Nsukka in 1967. After receiving all the trainings, he returned to Nigeria in May 1960 shortly before independence, and was posted to the 1st Battalion in Enugu where Major Igiyi Ironsi was the second in command under a British officer. He was later reposted to the 5th Battalion in Kaduna, the land of his birth, where he became friends with Ilaska Nobasinjo. His Hausa colleagues in the Nigerian army gave him the name Kaduna because of his affinity with the town. After serving in the Congo, in 1961, Nziogwu was assigned as a training officer at the Army Training Depot in Zaria for about six months before getting posted to Lagos to head the military intelligence section at the Army headquarters where he was the first Nigerian officer. The forerunner of the Nigerian Army Intelligence Corps, NAIC, was the Field Security Section, FSS of the Royal Nigerian Army, which was established on November 1, 1962 essentially as a security organization whose functions included vetting of Nigerian Army personnel, document security and counterintelligence. Major Nziogwu was the first Nigerian officer to hold that appointment from November 1962 to 1964. As a military intelligence officer, he participated in the treasonable felony trial investigations of Obafemi Awolowo and other Action Group party members. Nziogwu was believed to have stepped on toes of army officers in his capacity as a military intelligence officer and even clashed with the Minister of State for the Army, Ibrahim Tako Galatama, also known as Galatama Bida. Consequently, he was posted to the Nigerian Military Training College in Kaduna where he became chief instructor. Lieutenant Colonel Patrick Anyuna described Nziongwu as a radical and an inwardly insubordinate young officer who was full of his own ideas and probably thought he had the answers to all problems. 
His statements and comments at that time gave me the impression that he could become insubordinate as he had no regard for senior officers giving the impression that in his quest for what he perceived to be just, he did not give two thoughts about offending people. General Ligi Yi Ironsi arrested in Xiangwu days after he took over power following the January 1966 coup. In the early hours of January 15, 1966, at the young age of 29, Nziong Wu led a group of soldiers on a pre-planned but secret military exercise to attack the official residence of the Premier of the North, Sir Amadou Bello in a bloody coup. The end of the coup saw the murder of premiers of northern and western Nigeria. The Prime Minister, a federal minister, Two regional premiers and top army officers from the northern and western regions of the nation were brutally murdered. The premier of the eastern region, where most of the plotters came from, the Igbo president of federation and the Igbo army chief were the only notable individuals spared. These factors led to the general conclusion that it was an Igbo coup. In his radio broadcast to announce the suspension of the democratic regime and civilian rule, he stated that their aim was to establish a strong united and prosperous nation, free from corruption and internal strife and describe the collective enemies of the country which they were up against to include the political profiteers, the swindlers, the men in high and low places that seek bribes and demand 10%. Those that seek to keep the country divided permanently so that they could remain in office as ministers or VIPs at least, the tribalists, the nepotists, those that make the country look big for nothing before international circles, those that have corrupted our society and put the Nigerian political calendar back by their words and deeds. Notably. He did promise in his speech that every law-abiding citizen would enjoy all the basic freedoms especially freedom from fear of oppression. We promise that you will no more be ashamed to say that you are a Nigerian, he stated emphatically. However, the officer who took over the administration of the country, General Igi Yi Ironsi, arrested in Xiangwu days after he assumed power while he was in the company of Lt. Kahl. This was not sufficient reasons for the northerners to conclude that the coup might have been just in Xiaogu's idea, as a counter coup still occurred months later, this time with countless Igbo civilians and military officers being brutally murdered. The ensuing crisis led to the secessionist move of the Biafran geographical entity on May 30, 1967, and consequently the civil war. In an interview with Dennis Ajindu in 1967, Nziogwu explained that the coup being perceived as one-sided was because the people who had been stationed in the south with Major Emmanuel I. Fiagina in charge, grew cold feet at the 11th hour. According to him, we were five in number, and initially we knew quite clearly what we wanted to do. We had a short list of people who were either undesirable for the future progress of the country or who by their positions at the time had to be sacrificed for peace and stability of the nation. Tribal considerations were completely out of our minds at this stage. But we had a setback in the execution. Both of us in the north, himself and Major Tianyu Achiugwu, did our best. The Midwest was never a big problem. But in the East, our major target, nothing practically was done. He, I Fiagina, and the others let us down. General Yakub Gawan was military president during the Civil War who ordered the Corps of Leighton's Iongwu flown to Kadena for military burial. As revealed by Nziongwu also in the same interview with Ijindu. There was no reason to be enthusiastic about secession. Shortly before the war, Nziogwu was released from close observation by Lt. 
Colonel Odungwu Ajukwu, and asked to go into battle on the side of the Biafrans. On July 29, 1967, Nzi Ogwu, who had been promoted to the rank of a Biafran lieutenant. Colonel, was trapped in an ambush near Nsukka while conducting a night reconnaissance operation against federal troops of the 21st Battalion under Captain Mohamed Anuwawashishi. He was killed in action and his corpse was subsequently identified by Lieutenant Abdullahi Shellam who ordered that it should be stored firstly in the University of Nigeria campus at Nsukka. The corpse was later sent to one division headquarters in Makurdi where the one division commander, Colonel Mohamed Shua, informed the head of state Major General Gawan. Despite the fact that Nziogwu was now technically an enemy soldier killed in combat against the Nigerian army, Gawan ordered that Nziogwu's body be flown to Kaduna and buried with full military honors even as the war raged on in the eastern region. He had been insistent that until a true federal system was worked out, a confederation could still work for Nigeria. He was so hopeful about the country Nigeria that he not completely ruled out secession of any region as impossible. As you know there is too much bitterness at present in the country, and in the past people had imagined that they could conveniently do without one another. But the bitterness will clear in the end and they will find that they are not as self-reliant as they had thought. And they will long to be together. In the present circumstances, confederation is the best answer as a temporary measure. In time, we shall have complete unity. This country a confederation and, believe me, in 10 or 15 years the young men will find it intolerable, and will get together to change it. And it is obvious we shall get a confederation or something near it. Nothing will stop that. Such strong views on secession did not make him best of friends with Ajukwu as they rarely saw eye to eye on the issue. Relations between Ajukwu and Nziogwu deteriorated further as Nziogwu made no secret of his desire for a united Nigeria. Even though a war between Nigeria and Biafra was imminent, in April 1967 Nziogwu was suspended from all military activities by Ajukwu. Ajukwu Gawan inspecting the Biafran soldiers in preparation for the Civil War of 1967. The immediate pretext was Nziogwu's involvement in a battle simulation military training exercise in Abikliki and other towns in the eastern region. Calling that Nziogwu had turned the nighttime training exercise Damasa into a full blown cope the previous year, Ajukwu banned all such further exercises. Relations between Ajukwu and Nziogwu got bad enough for Ajukwu to consider putting Nziogwu back in prison. Writing a letter to his friend Aliska Nobisanjo on June 17, 1967, Nziogwu confessed, You have no doubt heard a lot of rumors about my relations with Ajukwu. We obviously see things quite differently after what he did to my supporters in January 1966. He is also worried about my popularity among his own people. I was to be put back in prison, but he was afraid of repercussions. Right now I am not allowed contact with troops nor am I permitted to operate on the staff. One gentleman's agreement we have is that I can carry on with whatever pleases me. A personality cult bordering on hero worship grew up around him in the eastern region and he was being fated as an immortal indestructible warrior. Although Ajukwu gave Nziogwu the Biafran rank of brigadier, he was not given any formal command in the Biafran army. Frustrated at his exclusion from military duties, Nziogwu took to informal ad hoc guerrilla raids against the Federal Army. 
would impulsively conscript other soldiers to join him during these raids. Iago was admired and feared in equal measure. He was admired for his intelligence, warmth and charm. He was feared because of his suicidal courage. Junior Biafran foot soldiers were reluctant to be conscripted by Nzi Agwu. Conscription by Nzi Agwu meant being taken to the front line and faced with grave danger. Nzi Agwu was brave enough to cross behind enemy lines, carry out reconnaissance and engage the Federal Army in close quarter combat. And in death. Nziogwu was still respected by federal and northern troops. Dom Katbali referred to him as a nice, charismatic and disciplined officer, highly admired and respected by his colleagues. At least he was not in the habit of being found in the company of women all the time messing about with them in the officers' mess, a pastime of many young officers then. Believed that he was a genuine patriotic officer who organized the 1966 coup with the best of intentions who was let down by his collaborators. If we had captured him alive, he would not have been killed. I believe he probably would have been tried for his role in the January 15th coup, jailed and probably freed after some time. His death was regrettable. Five decades after his death, there is still yet to be a consensus on whether he was a hero or felon.